Welcome, and thank you for downloading Movement Christian Church's sermon podcast. Here at Movement, we are passionate about God's Word and helping each other move closer to God. Thank you for choosing to grow with us today. Mm. I don't know how Bobby does it every single week, getting up here with like, you know, 10 seconds to, to get right on, and he's up here, man. He's, he's on spot. He's, he's on with it. Hey, my name is Stephen Reed. Welcome to Movement Church. If you guys are new and you don't know who I am, I'm Stephen. Uh, I'm not the lead pastor here. Bobby is, and he and his family, uh, they are, they're, they're right now try, enjoying being grandparents. Their oldest daughter and, and their husband had uh, their first grandbaby, and so Bobby and Sherry and the family are going down to spend some time with, uh, with, with the family and just enjoy being grandparents. Um, I get a chance to share with you guys this morning. Bobby, he said, hey, um, I know that we're going to be having a grandbaby soon, and whenever we do, I don't know when it's going to be, because, you know, you kind of can't really predict when that's going to happen. And he said, could you preach for me in place? And I was like, yeah. And so he said, um, hey, good news, it's this Sunday. <laughs> and I was like, rock on. He goes, can you preach within our series? And I was like, I don't know, what are you talking about? He goes, well, well what about love? And I was like, yeah, I guess I could do that one. I mean, that's you know, I guess I could talk about that. Um, so we're going through Romans chapter 8, um, but surprise, surprise, if you've heard me preach before, if you've heard me speak before, I typically don't follow scripts very well, so we're not going to take a look at Romans 8, at least not yet. Instead, we're going to take a look at John 21. So if you guys have a Bible, um, if you guys want to follow along, with, follow along with me, you can. And for those of you guys who might be watching online or at home, uh, I've been told that our slides aren't working, so if you want to grab a Bible versus having um, the, the words and, and passages on screen, you can just grab a Bible. So we're going to take a look at John 21. Before we get into John 21, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, how many of you guys ever had those magic eight balls when you were growing up? How many, how many of you guys ever used those things? How many of you guys ever, for me, I, I always ask the questions like, am I ever going to grow? And I'd turn it upside down, and thanks for laughing. Um, and it would, it would say things like, come back later. So like 20 years later, I did it and it was like, mm, still unclear. And it's like, oh, I guess I'm never going to get tall again. But those Magic 8 Balls, they, they were fun. They were always cool. Uh, I never used it in any true, honest sense of like, do my parents love me? I never, I never used it like that. I never used it in like, a, am, am I ever going to be someone important in life? I never used it in like real sense. And I think that if we're all honest, we probably have asked questions that we wouldn't ask Magic 8 Ball but that we would ask ourselves when we're in bed at night, or we would even ask the Father, we'd ask uh, God and say, God, what, what is it you want me to do in this world? What, what is it that you, like, do you have anything for me to do? Do you have, like, this burning bush experience? Do you have this road to Damascus experience? Am I, do you have anything like that for me, or am I just some schmuck that you forgot about? Um, and then maybe, Maybe a question that you've asked yourself that's even harder to ask that question or than the first one we just talked about. What, what is, have you, ever, have you ever done something spiritually or said something spiritually that you felt like, man, even if God had a plan for me, like I might have just messed it up. Like I might have just made it so that his call was like null and void. I, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Um, and today we're gonna take a look at a story in which I believe Peter is experiencing that same type of thing, and I think we're going to take a, we're going to look at his life and look at the words that they have in, in, with Jesus, his discussion he has with Jesus, and we're going to talk about this love concept. So if you guys have your Bibles and want to turn to John 21, well, go ahead and do, their, uh, do that for me. If you also want this, I know that is a small font, and uh, I, I, I didn't mention this, so my name is Stephen Reed, I mentioned that, but I work with a campus ministry over at NC State. And the campus ministry is called Campus Christian Fellowship. Movement Church supports the campus ministry there. You guys love on us all the time. You pray for us. You support us monthly. And then a handful of times a year, you guys come and bring food, like home-cooked food. Now, I don't know when the last time you guys were in college, but like home-cooked food for college students, like that's, that's like, that's almost like heaven on earth. Like it, it's just, it's just good stuff. So you guys are awesome that way. And, um, I, and my philosophy of teaching whenever I'm with my college students is I have come to learn that over the past 15, 20 years, college students are becoming more and more biblically illiterate. They, they don't know where things are in Scripture. And I, I present it in its full form, or at least a large chunk of it at a time, not because I'm against verse-by-verse verse reading or something like that, right? But because I want the students to mentally and to, and to know in their heart, like, wow, Stephen didn't just pull verse 1 and then pull verse 4 and then pull verse 9. Like, it's, just, it, it's, it's a flowing thought. 
I can trust it. It makes sense. So, so I know that it's hard for your eyes to see that, but that's a teaching style that I like because for college students, I want them to know that this stuff is trustworthy. This stuff, I'm not just making it up. I'm not just pulling one verse here and one verse there and one verse here. It's all flowing in the story. So that's why, that's why it's a small font for you. If you have your Bible and want to follow along there, you can. Otherwise, if you want to try to watch the screen there, you can. So John 21, 1 through 9, says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John, I added that in there, and the two other disciples were together. So there's, there's seven of them. Verse 3, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered, he said. Sorry, no, they answered. Then Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. I love this verse, verse seven. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which if you don't know, um, John is the one who's writing this gospel and he's the one who refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, which like, I love, like, I love that the Bible, I, I fully believe it's inspired and written by the Holy Spirit's inspiration, but it is also written by man. Like, like John, John, like the disciple whom Jesus loved. Anyway, I just I get, get a kick out of that. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he, being Peter, wrapped his outer, garment, outer, outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with some fish on it. Now I want to ask you guys a question. When you think of the word fisherman, what are some things that come to mind? What are some words that come to mind? Stink? Stinky, okay. Early morning, morning. all right, so not my kind of people. Patience, all right, what else? Did I hear food? Okay, so I heard bait, I heard food. I'm sorry? Fishing rod. I thought you were saying raw, and I was like, I hope they're not eating the raw fish. Maybe they do, but rod, I feel you, fishing rod, I hear you. All right, so um, now think about lifestyle. We've already heard a little bit about like stinky and, and early morning um, and, the, and the tools they had. What, what about lifestyle? Is there anything within the lifestyle? I'm not trying to get anything out of you. I'm just helping us think a little bit. I, I, I heard French. Relaxed, okay. Hot, all right. Oh, away from your family. Oh, it's a hobby. Yeah, it's, it's a hobby turned into a career a lot of times, yeah. Fun, peace, okay? Um, I, want, I, want, I want to read a, a passage real quick from Matthew. We've got a slide here for it. It's Matthew 4, 18 through 22. Now, one of the things I didn't do when I first started talking about John 21 is I love to teach from story um, as much as I love every word of the Bible and as much as I love every aspect of the Bible, whether it's poetry, whether it's the apocalyptic literature or the end times or if it's prophetic or if it's uh, the, the, the letters like the Apostle Paul writing letters, for example, Romans is a letter. So whatever genre it is, I really, really enjoy it. But the, but the ones that like, I cling to the most, that my heart like, connects with the most are the ones of story. And the reason why is because probably because the way my brain thinks, my brain thinks in story. And so whenever I can see a story and relate a truth from an epistle or from a letter to it, it just makes that much more sense to me. So I'm going to share a couple of different things from different stories to kind of help pull something out of John 21. Uh, Matthew 4. This is Jesus. Um, It's a story about Jesus calling his first disciples. And Matthew records it this way. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and so this is towards the early, early part of his ministry, um, maybe, maybe just a couple of months into his ministry, as, um, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, and, uh, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I, I love the fact that... Um, 
that Jesus, when he begins his ministry, he goes around the Galilee area, he's preaching and teaching, people are amazed at who he is, people are amazed at his preaching and his his teaching ability and his wisdom and his insight, and he's casting out demons, he's healing people, and so he goes and he finds some disciples, and he finds Peter, and he finds Andrew, and finds James and John, and they are just fishermen. They're just just fishermen. Nothing nothing crazy special about them. And I love that Jesus says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Which that like that is just an that is like an that is an awesome, beautiful, semantic, poetic way. Like not every job works that way. Like if you're a carpenter, God's not gonna be like, come follow me and I'll make you a carpet for men. Like it just doesn't work that way. Or if you're a fireman, he's not gonna say, Hey, come follow me and I'll let you set men on fire. Like it just doesn't work that way. Like not every job has that luxury, but fishermen does. And I love the fact that it's just this aver- it's just this average everyday thing. And God said, You know what? Jesus said, You know what? There are things about you as a fisherman, or whatever job you might have, there's things about you that make you unique. There's things about you that I can use for my kingdom. I don't always do this. We'll see if this works. Can you guys see this all right? Okay. Um, he's, Jesus says, there's things about you as fishermen that make you really special, make you really, re- really unique. I want to take the things about you, whether, whether you rise up early in the morning and you know what it means to put in a hard day's work, or, or I'm thinking in terms of fishermen, um, or you, you, know how to, you know how to set a hook. You know, how to, you know how to cast the net out there just right. You watch the waters, you watch the seasons, you watch the, you watch the climate of the day, and you know what's going on, and, and you have harnessed this, you've crafted this skill that makes you a perfect person, then I'm going to take those same attributes and make you a fisher of men. And if you've ever wondered the question, like we asked the eight ball earlier, where we were talking about, like, what is it that God wants to do with me in my life? Um, I think at its simplest, at its simplest, now they're, 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 there could be more layers to this, but at its simplest, I think that what God wants to do with you in your life is, is like this. Can you guys read that? It says God. And on the bottom, it says man. Now this is one of the things that I have taught at our campus ministry. Um, this, is, this is like a, a philosophy I have as far as helping our, students, helping our students know what is it that God is trying to call me to do. And I, I believe that in most situations, now unless you are the Moses who has the burning bush experience and you have like a, a one path you're supposed to walk and if you, if you don't, you know, you've missed the mark. What about like the other million and a half Israelite men that he brought out of Egypt slavery, or out of slavery in Egypt? Well, what about the other probably million women? So like two and a half to three million total. And what about the kids? Maybe like two more million there. So like Moses was leading out five million people and Moses had the burning bush experience, but what about the rest of them? Did, did, did they? I don't think so. And I think more often than not, the way that God works his will for our life is it's more of this umbrella concept. This umbrella idea that as long as you are doing, God, God isn't so much, as long as it's not sinful, God does not mind so much what you do as much or as instead he's more worried about who you are when you do those things, right? And so it looks like this. God has, God has desires that he wants to see happen on this earth. God has God has plans. He has, he has wishes. He has uh, the, the hope, for example, that, that people over in other countries can get to know the, the, to, to know the name of Jesus. He has hope that missionaries have the ability to communicate well with their supporters. He has hope that people in your workplace get to experience a Bible study or get to experience invitation to a church. He has, he has a desire for everybody to come to know his son. He also has a, is a desire for, for you to love your family well. He has a desire for you to speak words of kindness to people, right? So God has a lot of expectations. And I was going to do a different color, but I tested earlier, and this is uh, pretty dry, and it probably won't show up. So I'm just going to stick with the black marker here. And then man, man has abilities. We have our talents. And I just use man because it would be too hard for me to spell humankind. So I just put man down there, right? Um, Man has talents. We, we humans, we have abilities. We have things that we're good at. The fishermen knew how to look at the culture, look, knew how to look at the at the, the waters and see like this is a good time to go fishing. They they knew when it was a good time and when it wasn't a good time. Um, they knew how to be patient. They, I'm sure they got frustrated a lot of times, but for the most part, Jesus said, "There's things about you that you're good at, and there's things that I want done." 
And when those things intersect, like right here, or right here, or right here, or here, or here, or here, or here, wherever those lines intersect, they make an X. An X marks the spot. If you're trying to figure out what God wants to do with you in your life, the simplest, at its basic answer is find where your X marks the spot. Find where it is that what you can do lines up with what God wants done, and then do that. Um, if you are a teacher, it takes something special to work with children or work with teenagers in high school or elementary school, wherever you might be at. If you're a teacher, you know how hard it is to, to plan lessons and then to have to adjust on the fly when those lessons aren't received well or if there's like a, like, I, I don't know, if there's COVID and we, and we go to online classes. Like, like to be a teacher, you have to know how to be organized, you have to be planned, but you also have to be flexible. And guess what? Like those characteristics that make you a great school teacher would also make you a great Bible study leader for your church or for someone in your school, like maybe a Bible study leader for the other, other faculty at your church, or sorry, at the faculty at your school. Or maybe you're an engineer, maybe you're an architect, and you know the weight of, uh, that's a bad, bad time to use that word, you know the responsibility of making sure that your building is built properly. You know the responsibility it takes to make sure that your bridge is built properly and you have the right soil composition and you know how, you know how much concrete, and if I'm using the wrong words, it's because I'm not an engineer. Like, you, you know how, like, what it takes to build those things. And I think Jesus would say, you know what? You would make a great architect for men. You would make a great fisher of men. You, I, you're analytical. You know how much pressure something can take before it just busts. And, and you, that brings, not, not in like in a messed up way, but that brings you joy to be able to study that, to be able to study the soil, to be able to study the, the wind and, and like all the stuff that takes place in effect with like tall skyscrapers. Like your mind works in a way that is very deep and profound. And I think Jesus would say, there is a place for you in the kingdom of God to use those same talents to get what, to, to accomplish what he wants done. Maybe you just are a barista, and I say just, and I love baristas. I love coffee. Maybe you're a barista, and you're like, yeah, but what about me? Oh, my goodness, where do we begin? Like, you, every single day, you have people coming into your cafe, and, and a lot of them are there for a little bit of that relationship. They're also there for just a workplace. You can build relationships with people and love on them as just a barista, and all you're doing is just saying, like, hey, how's your day going? Hey, how's your day going? The next day, they come in. Hey, uh, you, had a, you had a big project to do this week. How, how'd it go? Like, you can build relationships. You can work within that. And Jesus says, if you, again, this is the umbrella idea. If, I don't, know so, I don't so much care what you do. I care more about who you are when you do it. If you're the kind of person that's using this umbrella and saying, okay, I'm going to work at this cafe, or I'm going to work at my school, or I'm going to work at my architecture firm, or my law firm, or whatever else it might be that you do, and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Jesus with me. I'm going to live like Jesus would if he were in my shoes. I'm going to be a fisherman in my place. I'm going to be a fisher of men in my place. Does that, does that make sense? So I believe that that's one of the things that, that I love about Jesus calling the disciples. He calls, them, he calls the fishermen and says, I want you guys to follow me. Um, go back to our John 21 slide. I'm going to set this aside for just a moment. Make sure I don't hit that beautiful guitar. <laughs> Did I hear you say amen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely, definitely, amen. Um, so X marks the spot. But there's something crazy going on in this story. Why were they in the boats in the first place? If you read John 21, just open your Bible up and you start reading John 21, the story begins just kind of like any other story. There's some place, some time of day, and there's some people around. You just kind of pick up where the story begins if you aren't looking to think of, like if you aren't looking to understand what's going on. And so John 21 begins with this, this kind of this odd thing of like, why are they in the boat? Like, yeah, it's cool that they saw Jesus again and, and that they went, Peter said, hey, I'm going to go fishing. And they got in the boat and they didn't catch anything. And then Jesus said, hey, have you caught anything? Like, no. He's like, throw it on the, on the, on the right side of the boat. And so they hauled in this big amount of fish. And then G Peter gets out of the boat and runs to Jesus. Like, it's a cool story until you ask the question of why were they in the boat in the first place? Um, to understand John 21, 
We're going to fast forward from Matthew 5, through, and we're just, going to take a, we're just going to take a quick shot. I'm just going to quickly give you what's going on. So Jesus calls his disciples in Matthew 4. In fact, most of the Gospels, all of the Gospels have, have the account of Peter being called. So the, the disciples are called, and for the next three and a half years, they live in this rabbinical, the, Jesus is the rabbi, and they are following his teaching. They're basically his disciples, his students, his pupils. And for three and a half years, they've been everywhere Jesus goes. Every food that he eats, basically they eat. Everywhere Jesus sleeps, basically they're sleeping as well. Like they are, they are with him at all time. And then comes the Last Supper. And the Last Supper goes that Jesus basically, my paraphrase, my Stephen paraphrase, says, hey, um, there's somebody here who's going to de- who's gonna deny me. And Peter says, well, I don't know about these guys, Jesus, but I, I am not going to deny you. I will go to my grave for you. And ironically, he wasn't the one that Jesus was even referring to, but Jesus ended up saying, you know what, Peter, um, it, by just sunrise, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, nah, it's not going to happen. So then fast forward a little bit. They're in the garden. Jesus is praying. Fast forward a little bit more. Some of the uh, high priests and the chief priests and the Roman centurions come to arrest Jesus because now the, the betrayer Judas comes and kisses Jesus and Jesus is now arrested. Fast forward just a couple more hours and you see Peter, all the disciples fled except for Peter and one other one. And Peter, it goes to where Jesus is at and he's, Jesus is being tried at night, which he shouldn't have been, but that's another, neither here nor there. He's being tried in, this, in, the, in the high priest courtyard and, and Peter is there. He's not like at the courtroom, but he's there in the courtyard and he's observing. And somebody, a, a young servant girl, says, hey, Peter, she didn't know his name, weren't you one of his disciples? And Peter's like, no, I, I, I don't know him. Then a little bit later on, maybe five minutes, maybe 25 minutes, I have no idea. But just a little bit later on, some other people say, wait, I think I recognize you. You're one of his disciples. Peter's like, no, I, I've never met that man in my life. I don't know what you're talking about. And then, and then a third time, someone says, nope, I'm pretty sure you are one of his disciples. Like, I think you're even like his head honcho guy. And Peter's like, I, and this is like almost all the gospels who recount his, they all recount his denial, but almost all of them account it this way, that he got so angry that he started asking down curses on them, saying, I don't know this man. How dare you accuse me of, of whatever you're accusing him of, but whatever you're going to kill him for, I don't know him. Like, that's pretty messed up. And then the rooster crows, and the gospels all say, in their own way of saying it, One of them says that he went outside and broke down. Another one says he went out broken and wept bitterly. If you don't understand John 21, 1, from the perspective that Peter is broken, I don't think we understand John 21, 1 just yet. Matthew 28, verse 16 tells us that after Jesus was crucified and rose again, then he goes and he appears to his disciples and he says, I want you guys... um, to meet me in Galilee. And Matthew 28, 16 says, specifically, there's a mountain in Galilee that I want you to go to and meet me there. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of Galilee. Does that sound like the mountain? I don't think so. It happened this way. Simon, Peter, and the others were together. I am going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. Now, John McCarthy, he's a modern-day preacher, modern-day um, commentary, modern-day author within the Christian faith, and John McCarthy says that in the Greek, this I'm going out to fish is not just a sentence, it is a statement. It is a, basically, I'm going back to fishing. John 21, Peter is at this, have you ever been this broken? Have you ever been this, can God use me? Like, like I, I, know he, I know that he had a, a plan for me, maybe, but can God use me? Peter says, I'm going to go back to fishing. I'm going to go back to what I was good. I'm going to go back to what I know because that's just what I know, and I don't think I'm good enough anymore. So then the story, as, as we've already read this part here, um, they, they, they catch this huge amount of fish, and then from verses 10 through 14, it's basically them just having some breakfast together, and I want to pick up the story with verse 15, 15 through 19. And our story goes like this. It says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Jesus said. Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced falls in your life. I've got, I've got some pictures here. I've got one picture um, that, that was me back in the early 2000s, and it's me and my friend. I'm in the blue shirt, my friend's in the white shirt, and we're doing some rock climbing. Now, you probably can't tell very well from this picture, but we are on a ledge that's about maybe four or five feet wide, and the, and the cliff is, or the rock face is going up probably about 100 feet or so. The next slide I've got is, or the next picture I've got is, that's from the view down. It's not the exact same location, but we're talking maybe about 20 feet apart. Um, I used to climb this place all the time. It was, it, was, it was off of the Tennessee River there in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I would go there and I would rock climb all the time. And go back to the one where like, it's, it's me and Kevin. So we're, we're doing some climbing, and um, <laughs> if you know much about rock climbing, which I haven't done in a long time, because you know, if I did, I wouldn't have this, but I, I, I haven't gone climbing in a long time, but um, one of the things you're supposed to do if you're being a good person or being smart is you want to be clipped in no matter what's going on. You want to be clipped in no matter if you're climbing or if you're not climbing. Well, on this one particular time, two of my friends, Kevin was there, another one of my friends, Andy, and then I believe it was Andy's girlfriend at the time, was there with us. So the four of us were rock climbing, and, and the, the girl was, was climbing up, and I don't, I don't remember how far she had gotten. Kevin and I were just, you know, we weren't, locked, we weren't clipped in, but she was clipped in and the belayer was clipped in. And, and Kevin and I were just talking, having a good time, laughing. And the next thing I know it, she has fallen off and she like swoops down and comes and like hits into me and we both go out over this ledge. Now from the first picture or the other picture I showed you, like it's, it's a pretty far ways down. It's like, it's like a hundred foot drop to, yeah, there's water, but there's also like rocks and jagged stuff right underneath that water's ledge. And have you guys ever watched cartoons like the Roadrunner or something like that? Whenever like they're running and the, and the Roadrunner and them like cross over into air, and then like the next thing you know, the like, Roadrunner's on land, but the coyote's like standing above, and he's just like, Oop, and then like he realizes it starts falling. All right, so that's kind of what happened. She hits into me. I f- we we fly out. She's anchored in. She starts to swing back in, and I am not anchored in. So I grabbed on her and we swing back in and like there was a moment where it was like this is going to not end well for me. This is, this is going to be a hard fall. I am not looking forward to the consequences of this fall. And I believe that Peter in our story in John 21 is feeling the same type of like gut-wrenching <sighs> like have you ever had those like I don't know what to do. Like I, can God use me? Have you ever been there? Now, I, I, will, I will tell the story in a different way. I'll qualify at the end of what I'm talking about. The story that we have with John 21, 15 through 19, if you want to go back to that slide, you can. The story we have is that Peter and Jesus are together with the disciples. Jesus asks Peter, almost in a public venue, like Jesus, or Peter denied Jesus three times publicly, so why not reinstate him three times publicly, right? So Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you... Do you love me more than these? Um, in the Greek, and I don't want to make much of this, but I'm going to. In the Greek, there are multiple words for love. One is agape, one is phileo, one is eros. Agape love is this heavenly covenant love that the church basically took and, and like made that word even, it made that word very, very powerful. Made that word very, um, I don't want to use this word because it's not quite the right phrasing, but we made it very Christian. We, we made it very holy. We, like agape is like the, this deep, deep love. And phileo, phileo is a deep love. In fact, there are times when even God in, in scripture says that he agapes Jesus as well as he phileos Jesus. So like they are interchangeable. I would be lying to you if I said they are different words. They are different words, they are somewhat interchangeable, but I don't believe they're always interchangeable. Phileo is the word for brotherly love. It is a deep, intimate love that you have with your friends, with even, even your, your significant other, your spouse. Your, and and it's phileo love is a deep love, but I don't think it's quite on par with agape love. And this is what happens. Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? What are the these? I, I have no idea. 
Scholars argue all the time, are the these talking about the other disciples? Like, do you love me more than they love me? Which I don't see Jesus doing that. That's like, that's just so petty. Maybe Jesus is saying, do you love me more than you love them? Possibly. I, I, I very much could see that being the case. Most scholars actually lean that way. I lean more towards the idea with other scholars that the refers to the boats and the fish and the nets. Do you love, because, I mean, honestly, if it was them, we I mean, would have said them. Do you love me more than these? I think it's the fish. I think it's the boats. And if I'm wrong, it doesn't really matter because Jesus is still getting at the idea of do you agape me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. Then feed my lamb. Jesus said, Simon, son John, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Peter was hurt, and I, and I believe this is one of the reasons why Peter was hurt. Peter was hurt because, I thought it was mine for a second. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. Um, I totally, totally get where Peter's coming from. And I, I mentioned earlier that, that some Greek scholars don't believe those words are that big of a difference. And honestly, it, the story is still true, even if they don't have that big of a difference. The story is still true that Jesus goes to Peter and says, Peter, I know that you think you've fallen away, and I know you think you're unusable, but I, 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 I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to reinstate you. But this is how this is going down uh, in, my, in, my, in my understanding of it. Peter, do you heavenly, covenantly, agape love me? And Peter's like, I, I denied you? I brought down curses on people, and then when you were crucified, I wasn't even there. I left you high and dry, Rabbi. In your darkest hour, I was not there. Obviously, I don't know what agape love looks like. I do love you. I do, I do have this incredible amount of love for you. I mean, you are the... You are the you are my rabbi. I've given up everything for three and a half years. And, and yeah, I messed up. But I don't know if I agape. I phileo. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And the second time, Peter, do, do you agape? Do you covenantly? Are you sold out? Are you covenant love for me? Do you have that? Peter, I think, is probably in the same situation I would be in. Do you even want me to love you? Like, I, if, if I am being Peter, if I'm supposed to be the one that is, like, on the confession of faith that I gave earlier in the gospel, that on that you are going to build your church, like, do you want me to be one of the leaders in this thing? Like, yeah, I did some great things for you, but did you not see me two weeks ago? Did you not see what I did? I, do you want me? Is this a trick question? Am I supposed to say, nah, you should just kick me out of the group entirely? I don't, what am I supposed to say? I don't know if I agape. So the best I'll do, the best I've got, I phileo. And then Jesus brings it down, in my opinion, brings it down and says, okay, all right, Peter, do you, do you phileo me? And I, and I think that that hurt Peter because not only was it the third time, like the, like the denial third time, but it was also like the third, like in that moment it was lowered a little bit and I think Peter was hurt because it was lowered a little bit. But I, I but, he answers it and says, yeah, yeah, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. You know that I phileo you. And Jesus says, okay, all right. Feed, feed my lamb. Pasture or, or, or take care of my flock. And then the third time, she, feed my sheep. All three of those deal with this idea of Peter, the thing I called you to, I'm still calling you to it. The, the X marks a spot for you, like it's, you're still good. You're, I'm still calling you. He doesn't just leave it there. At the very end, he says, verse 19. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't mention this. Um, I always wondered, verse 18, like, verse 18 is the weirdest, strangest thing to follow up after, like, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, yes, yes. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would dress yourself, and, and you went where you wanted. Sorry, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Like, that made no sense to me. Especially the next line, um, Jesus had said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now, if you are Peter, and you have just had a gut-wrenching fall, and Jesus just asked, do you agape me? I phileo. Do you agape me? I phileo. 
Okay, okay, Peter, do you phileo me? Yeah, I phileo you. If you've just been in that situation, if you just had a fall, and then God says, and then Jesus says to you, hey, um, you're probably wondering your future right now. You're probably wondering if you could ask like a magic eight ball, where do I stand with God? You're probably wondering, am I gonna be useful? Am I gonna be used? I'm here, Jesus, I'm saying to, Jesus is saying to Peter, I'm here to prophesy to you. I'm here to let you know the kind of death that you're gonna die. And it's not a comfy death when you're old because you didn't risk anything for the gospel. You're the kind of death that you're going to die, Peter, is a very painful death. It's a crucifixion. In fact, Peter, when he was crucified, history has it that he said, I'm not even worthy to be crucified correctly, so crucify me upside down. I believe that that verse, verse 18 and 19, was exactly what Peter needed to hear. It made no sense to me most of my, my, most of my life until I realized that Peter was broken. He was beyond broken. And for Jesus to say, for Jesus to say, if this is where I want agape to be, this is where I want you to be at, and you're right here. Or maybe you're right here. Maybe they're even more interchangeable than what we're, what we're talking about. But either way, there's, there's a difference in the words. I want agape, you've got phileo. You will eventually get to the kind of love, the agape love, where Jesus said, no greater love is anybody than to lay down his life for his friend. You will eventually get there. And I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm going to prophesy to you so that you have hope that you, are, you want here, but you're here. And how do you get there? Very next line. Then Jesus said to him, follow me. How do you get from here to here? You follow. You, you, every, every step of the way, you say, okay, God, I don't know what everything is in the spiritual world. I don't, know every, I, don't know how I, I don't know how you want to handle my life, but I know that right now, I know what's in front of me right this very moment, and I'm going to be obedient in that very moment. I don't know what an hour from now is going to hold, but I know what right now holds. I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold, but I know what right now holds. I don't know what my company's going to look like tomorrow, God, but I know what my company looks like right now, and I know what you're asking me to do right now. I, I don't know what my job's going to look like tomorrow, but I know what my job looks like right now. I don't know. We don't know but we know what happens right now. And Jesus says, in those moments, just follow me. Um, go ahead and go to our, our Romans 8 passage. Ooh, it's 11.25. I'll wrap up with, with this. Um, Bobby asked me, he said, hey, could you preach from Romans 8? And I said, yeah, but probably not like you want me to. Um, I'm going to use it at the very end. And he said, okay. Or at least I hope he said okay. This is what, th I'm, we're going to read this. We're going to read this real briefly and we're going to look at it through the lens of John 21. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have called, sorry, who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, real quick, those, the works all good things. Um, it's in light of what happens in verse 30, in verse 39, where you are in Christ, you're growing to be like Christ. So it says, God works all things for the good of those who love him, which basically means when you follow me, when you follow me, you don't know what's happening every single day, but when you follow me, I will take all the bad, I will take all the hurl at insults, I will take all the layoffs, I will take all of the, the, the horrible things that people said to you or did to you or treated you or even the things that you did, the way that you fell away. I will take every bad thing, I will take everything and I will bring some good out of it. And that good will mean that you will look more and more like my son. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. There we go again. That image of his son is the part that is important for us. God knows what's happening in our lives and he will work those so that we can look more like his son. The, that he might be, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Do you know what we are in this room? We are brothers and sisters. Jesus went before us, and through him, we are brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, those he gave, the X marks a spot, those he has a plan for, he justifies, those he justifies, he glorifies. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If you've taken a fall, if you've even denied Christ, who's, who's really against you? It's probably, probably the evil one and probably your own guilt. Verse 32. Sorry, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to the things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, being Jesus, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one, at least no one of importance, because Satan's already lost. 
Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Just like he interceded with Peter, saying, Peter, I'm going to intervene. I'm gonna, I want to reinstate you. I'm, I'm, I'm intervening right now. Jesus is intervening for us at the right hand of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, shall any of those things, shall any of the things, that, shall that stuff separate us? As it is written, for the sake we face death all day long, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, depth, or debt, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, this section has a lot of doctrinal things we could talk about, and I'm glad I didn't talk about any of those things. What I wanted to talk about is this idea that if you are in Christ, that last phrase there, um, I'm, I'll move out of the way so the band wants to come up, you can. Um, that last phrase right there says, Neither death, neither neither height nor depth, or nor anything else in all creation will be able to will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you are in Christ, and you have that calling, if you have that that desire to say, okay, the the responsibility I have to live out this faith is to follow Him. If you are in Christ, there's nothing that will separate you from Christ. There's nothing that will separate you from the love that God has for you. In fact, Jesus is interceding on your behalf. If you are wondering, man, I, even if I knew what God wanted me to do in this life, have I messed it up to the point at which he can't use me anymore? And the answer is no. If you are in Christ, the answer is no. If you want to know how you get in Christ, you get in Christ by having faith, by being baptized, by having the Holy Spirit come into your life and change your life and to guide you in his life and to live a life of faith. And if you already have done those things and you're wondering again, man, like what about two weeks ago or two months ago or two years ago? I think Jesus would say, yeah, if you confess these things, just like James and, and John, the, uh, the letters tell us, if you confess one to another, then the Lord is faithful. And if you confess to the Father, then God is faithful to forgive you. If you confess and if you move past it and you follow me, follow, not me, but follow Jesus, if you follow him, this agape love covers you. And as you're growing in phileo to agape, all you have to do is follow him, find where the X marks a spot, and just live every day for him. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll go ahead and have a song. Hmm. Father, um, I know I mess up all the time. I know that, um, I know I'm immature. I know that, I don't know. I know there's a lot to work on with me. Father, thank you for working on me. Um, and whenever I wonder, when I hold my hands up and I hold the things up in life that I've done for you and I say, just, I, I don't know, am I good enough? And it, the answer really is, it doesn't really matter if you're good enough. The answer is, or the, what matters is if you, are in, if you are in my son. And if you're in my son, then you know I love you. If you're in my son, Jesus, uh, Stephen, if, you, if you're in Jesus, then, then Stephen, you know that we're good. So God, I pray, I pray for all of us um, that when we go through those dark nights, when we go through those frustrations, when we go through those questions of, is agape really something that I can have in my life? The answer is yes. May we grow in that. May you be with these people. May you be with myself as we grow in what it means to love you, to learn how to love you. And at the end of it, whenever Jesus just tells Peter, just follow me. That is some of the hardest things to do and yet some of the most simplest things to do. Just follow me. Teach me what it means to walk every day as if you were walking in my shoes. In Christ, I'm going to pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to Movement Christian Church's sermon podcast. Want to learn more about us? You can do that by visiting our website at movementchristianchurch.com or on our app available on iOS and Android devices under Movement MC.